everyone, Clint Lee here along with Ted Bauman with the next edition of Your Money Matters. Uh, before we get started, as always, uh, be sure to check out the link uh, above my top left, should be in the top right corner of your screen to learn how to get started with the Bauman letter. Lots of uh, different opportunities across uh, different sectors, uh, different risk return makeups uh, in our model portfolio. So click the link to learn how to get started there. Uh, today, I want to talk about the, uh, the dip that we have had uh, here in the stock market lately. I think the NASDAQ is now down about 10% off the peak. And so everyone's wondering now, is this the time to step in? A lot of dip buying has happened before. Uh, and so, Ted, I know you wrote something here just recently about uh, how to use fundamentals, how to use valuations. Those things matter again to evaluate an opportunity. So I wanted to start there and get your take uh, on, on what you're looking at, how you're evaluating the space. Maybe especially let's start with uh, growth stocks and what you're, you're seeing there so far. Well, you know, if you want to sort of take everything and put it into one sort of uh, metric, you could use duration, um, which is, you can think of duration as the number of years it would take um, an asset to generate enough uh, earnings, you know, to be able to justify its current price. Um, and, you know, there's some debate about this. It's certainly not an exact science, but um, for example, if, uh, you know, a, a, a stock has a duration of 10, let's say, uh, and interest rates go up by 1%, then, you know, the idea is that they would fall by 10% in price for every 1% increase. And right now, the S&P's average duration is 36.5. So a 1% increase uh, in uh, interest rates, given that duration, which is a function of valuation, right? It's, it's, it's you know, highly valued stocks take longer to you know, to earn back the money that you spend on the stocks. When you get durations at that level, uh, a 1% increase could, you know, basically be catastrophic for the market. Um, and this is why I think the Fed has been signaling so, so early, because they want the market to know this. They, they don't want the market to, to find out, you know, to, to get blindsided by this. This is all part of the whole kabuki that's going on between the Fed and the markets. And so what we're seeing now is anticipatory. Um, you know, because, you know, the, 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 the whispers are that the Fed's going to raise rates faster than everybody thinks. That's what they want them to think. The market is telling the Fed that they think that. And um, whatever happens, whatever we're looking at is going to be a big pullback in growth. So uh, that's what we're seeing. Uh, yeah, and I think one, one point there, too, about duration um, and just the valuation aspect you know, another way to think about it too is just how you know when are your when's what's the timing of your cash flows? When do your cash flows occur? And right. you know, grow because growth stocks have become such a, a dominant force in an in index like the S and P five hundred. The lot of growth stocks, I mean, the you know a lot of that profitability uh, rests you know way out into the future, and so that that's what makes you know that whole discounting mechanism uh, of bringing those cash flows back to present day, the, the further out they are, the more impact that discounting mechanism. So when you have rising rates, you know, that's where you, you really start to see the impact and why that, that duration figure you, may, you threw out there for the uh, S&P 500 uh, has been so impactful so far this year. And remember, um, it, it, you get the, the duration for the index, but then you get the duration for individual stocks. And so what, I'm, what I think we're seeing, I mean, we're seeing plenty of stocks that have lost over 20% of their value already this year, even more. And those are the stocks that basically have that long, you know, pathway to, to profitability. But let's just flash a chart that sh illustrates this. It, here is um, basically the the blue line is the S and P 500 value ETF, which you know represents the value stocks. The red is the S and P, and the green is uh, growth stocks. And you know that's a pretty pretty straightforward picture. I mean, the only ones that are in positive territory at all are uh, you know. Are, are the, the value stocks. But there's a second factor here, and I'll just flash it up quickly. Here's a, a little table that shows the expected um, EPS increase for, for this year and over the next two years for those three categories, growth value and the overall market, and clearly value is going to lead. So, but you take those two things together, or together and boom, you know, you get a rotation, which is what I think we're think, uh, seeing. I want to go back to um, what you're writing about earlier this week. So I know you, you went through and you broke down a bunch of different um, types of, of fundamental or valuation metrics to, to evaluate stocks on. And I think one thing that's important to highlight is that, you know, there, there's not necessarily a, a one size fits all. There's not, you know, necessarily one metric in particular that you can use across every sector. So like for industrials, you know, for the most part, you know, analysts are evaluating 
uh, industrials, at least from a valuation standpoint on enterprise value relative to their EBITDA or mm -hmm. you know, something like uh, the REIT sector. I mean, to try to use a, a price earnings ratio to evaluate a REIT is, is pretty right. much pointless. You need to use yeah. cash flow. So I guess my, my one question is, you know, it, to, to the extent that there, there could be something that's at least close to one size fits all. I mean, is there, is there a metric, a gauge? Is there something that, that you use um, that, you know, viewers could use to, to quickly, you know, evaluate what's going on, you know, across different sectors? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say it's probably the peg ratio is the one I like the, the most. I um, mean, of course, you have to, like you just said, you have to look at uh, price in relation to the, the appropriate kind of earnings growth. Um, as opposed to, you know, you know what, like, for, for example, you said REITs, that's, that's funds from operations, uh, FFO or adjusted FFO. So if you use that as the, your measure of growth, um, then I think um, PEG is a more or less one size fits all. Because what it does, it tells you um, the relationship between the current price to earnings ratio and it's expected, or sorry, usually it's trailing 12 months um, growth in in whatever the the metric is whether it's funds from operations or earnings or you know whatever um and, and the great thing about that is that it it tells you straight away whether a stock is moving sufficiently quickly towards its high valuation you know whether it's justified um, but again it's not a one size fits all um, there are lots of reasons for example some companies um choose to use their earnings to reinvest in themselves. And so that might keep their earnings growth slow, um, but the market knows that they're doing that, so they price them highly anyway. I mean, Amazon is the classic case in point. It did that for a decade, you know? Um, so you gotta dig under the hood. And that's, I think the critical thing here is that once you shift from technical analysis of price movements to fundamentals, uh, there's a lot more work involved um, or just a different kind of work you have to understand what drives those metrics. And I think that's the, a key piece of advice for people. Um, but just to, to give us some time to be able to give some recommendations here, I just wanna also just show a chart that shows the 10 year treasury yield right now. Right now it's testing the previous high of December, 2019 before the pandemic. Those You can see those three big drops in the next three months, that was all pandemic related anticipatory. Um, but the key thing here is that you know the, the rates were rising pretty quickly towards the end of 2019. And I think they were probably raising back towards the, the next resistance level, which is somewhere around 3% yield on, on a treasury. Now, if if that happened, you know, if we went from where we are today, which is about 1.85, I think, uh, to three, then you're gonna see a whole world of pain ac across different parts of the market. And so paying attention to those valuations is what we're doing. So next question is, um, if all this works out the way we think, where do we go next? I mean, what do you like at this point? Why right, don't you so get... yeah, what I like at this point, I mean, if I if I put on sort of my, my valuation lens and I, I wanna look for um, opportunities that are out there, you know, one thing we're gonna talk about for um, a little while is, is just on the international side. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we bring that up every now and then we talk about sort of the, the valuation differentials between what you're seeing here in the U.S. and, and internationally. And so I'll, I'll show you a chart right now just to, uh, to point that out. Um, this comes from top down charts. This looks at the uh, valuations, the P.E. ratio using a 10 year average of earnings. So that's that cyclically adjusted P.E. ratio that we've talked about before, just comparing it across three different regions. So you have the, the U.S. is a black line on here. Uh, developed markets, excluding the U.S., so just developed internationals, the blue line, and then emerging markets uh, is the red line. And you can see this this P/E ratio. This goes all the way back to 1985. You know, you hear about all the comparisons of, of U.S. valuations to the dot com bubble. Well, this kind of this shows exactly that. You know, we've got this uh, this ratio uh, back up into a dot com bubble territory, uh, pushing around 45 on that ratio. Meanwhile, you know, look at where we are with uh, emerging markets, in particular, developed markets as well. You know, they, they've come up in recent years, but they are well below, still well below their prior peaks. Now, I, I think this is an interesting time to, to uh, be looking at international because, look, you know, a lot of what's driven the, mar the U.S. market's outperformance uh, over the last several years has just been, you know, stronger U.S. growth and just the, the dominance of, of U.S. companies and what they've seen in terms of their earnings potential. But I'm, I'm wondering if that's starting to change a little bit here because, you know, we've got the, the Fed embarking on this very hawkish pivot. You know, at the same time, the, you know, someone like the, the probably the next most important central bank is the ECB. 
you know, they're, they're still maintaining this transitory message which uh, for inflation, which is important because they're still insisting they're not doing anything on, on the rate front uh, until 2022, you know? And so if, if that's more stimulus for the economy and look at how this is starting to show up. I, I saw this chart from Liz on, Lizanne Saunders this morning. Um, and this, is a, uh, this shows the Citigroup's economic surprise index for the US uh, is the blue line on here and the Eurozone is the, the uh, yellow orangish line. Mm -hmm. And so what, what this is showing is how economic data is currently coming in relative to expectations. So you can see uh, just recently, you know, we're seeing a, a pullback in how U.S. economic data is coming in relative to expectations. It's underperforming. Meanwhile, uh, Europe's picking up. You know, I, I bring this up because, once again, I think what's, what you're going to see at the stock prices is, is movements that are, are reflecting growth differentials. And you know, are we seeing the early early innings of the U, of, of the eurozone outperforming the U.S. in in that regards? Now, the last point I'll bring up with all this is currency movements are incredibly important. You know, with the a, a, for for a U.S. investor looking at international opportunities, a strengthening dollar hurts your returns. A, a weakening dollar, a strengthening foreign currency uh, helps your returns. And last chart I have here for for this is that the U.S. dollar has been on a tear over the past year, but it's finally starting to show some signs of weakness. So here's the, the US dollar index. And I've got these, uh, these green channel lines on here to, to illustrate this channel and just how strong the dollar's been. Uh, once again, going back to about April or so, April or May of, of last year, uh, and we're just now starting to break below this channel along with that black line, the 50-day moving average. So just at least from a, a technical standpoint, we're starting to see a little bit of a breakdown there, but I, you know, one of the things I think is, is that's, that's showing up uh, and sort of that that growth outlook differential that you're st starting to see emerge uh, in the U.S. versus international regions. Now, just two quick ways to play this, you know, and, and I, I like these because it's a way to generate income. Uh, one is with the uh, IDV, it's an iShares International Dividend ETF. It has a yield of about 7.6%. This is just a, a way um, to purely play the developed international space, uh, the big sector weights or financials and utilities. Uh, the other way, if you want to get more specific to uh, holding emerging markets, there is a DEM, is the Wisdom Tree Emerging Markets uh, High Dividend ETF. It has a 5.9% yield uh, and 53%, or I'm sorry, 35% of its, of its holdings is split between energy and materials. So you're getting some commodities exposure there. One thing I'll warn you about when you look under the hood to this, uh, depending on your viewpoints on, on China and Taiwan, those two uh, countries make up about 45% of exposure. So I know there's, there's some viewers who probably don't want to go anywhere near China, whereas you know, others are, are looking at uh, bargain opportunities with a pullback in many of those names there. And both of those ETFs, sorry, are up uh, almost 6% this year. So, you know, good, good spotted there. But just on the China thing, remember it, the nice thing about ETFs, um, uh, you know, is that they, particularly if they're actively managed, you can you can change your holdings, you know, based on what's going on uh, under the hood. So, uh, you know, maybe the China thing, it could go either way. I mean, we, you might see them change the, the composition. For my side, I, I like commodities. Uh, here's a chart that shows uh, annual returns, sort of average annual returns going back from to 1970 during periods of declining inflation and increasing inflation. And, um, you know, clearly the winner when inflation is declining is stocks and when it's rising it's commodities um and you know the, there are a lot of reasons for that but uh you know one of the the, the critical reasons i think is that commodities uh you know because they tend to be priced in dollars if if you know if inflation is rising then, then their prices will rise along with it the other thing is that rising inflation generally goes along with strengthening economic activity which means that you know the demand for commodities increases and of course, commodities can also play a hedge, uh, you know, against inflation and, and also dollar weakness. There's all, all kinds of reasons why you want commodities. And of course, everybody's favorite commodity, uh, for better or for worse, is oil. And we know what oil's doing. It's, I don't know what it's doing today, but it was pushing $90 a barrel earlier this week. So um, any way you look at it, commodities is a good space to be. Uh, my two plays would be GSG. Um, they, now, this, these, are, these are both ETFs. Uh, that really use futures, uh, you know, and that's the way you want to play commodities because then what's happening is you're getting the, the, the future price action built into the contracts, you know, into those futures contracts. So uh, that's why I think, both, you know, the, these, are, these are both up quite strongly this year as well. You can see if you go over on the right-hand side, here's GSG's chart. You can see a pretty strong green arrow there. 
Uh, but look at its previous high back in 2014. Um, you know, that it, 2014 was kind of when uh, the, the Fed gave up fighting back against, um, you know, the market. There was the taper tantrum, then the Fed started pulling back. But the key thing was that inflation rates were just going slower and slower and slower. So we had this slowflation economy right throughout the, the 2000s and the, and the 2010s and all that. Oh, sorry, the, the, the 2010s. Um, and that really kind of wasn't good for commodities. And, and you know, global growth was like two percent a year. It wasn't great. Right. And now that's all changing. So look at at, at the potential price appreciation there. I put the crosshair on the previous high. You could maybe get back there. I don't think you'll get back there immediately, but um, you know that's the potential. Uh, here's DBC, which is another ETF, uh, same kind of action. Uh, it's risen uh, actually a lot more strongly uh, than GSG, uh, but it still has a ways to go to recover its previous highs. Um, so, you know, those are easy ways to play commodities. And if you look under the hood of both of those, you're going to see futures contracts. So you can't play that directly yourself unless you sign up with a, uh, what do they call them? CTAs or um, right. the commodity, commodity trade. trading advisor. Yeah. Yeah. Which right. is a, a whole nother um, ball game, but that this is a way you can get a piece of that action. Okay. So that's my recommendation. All right. Well, there you go. So yeah, if you're, if you're out there, if you're evaluating a, a buy the dip opportunity, uh, there's a, a few valuation, valuation metrics we've talked about to, to help you evaluate those. Uh, but otherwise, I mean, the big issues facing the markets today, uh, valuations and inflation, and we've given you a, a couple different ways uh, to, to play both of those themes here. Okay. Well, that is all for us this week. Zero Money Matters. And please remember to uh, check out the Bauman letter. Just click out the click the link uh, that's above my left shoulder on the top right of your screen there. And oddly enough, it doesn't appear as a link, does it? It's a little round dot with an eye in the middle of it. And I finally realized that after all these years. Click the eye, folks, and see what, uh, what you can do. Remember, it's a money-back guarantee. Anyway, we'll talk to you again next week. Bye.